Um, I'm very pleased to introduce General Sir Nick Pope to the meeting. General Sir Nick is just three months into his new post as the Chair of the Confederation of Service Charities. Having graduated from Cambridge, Sir Nick commissioned into the Army in 1981. He served in Bosnia and Afghanistan. His last appointment was as Deputy Chief of the General Staff, although the one I enjoyed most in his biography was as Master General of the Ordnance, which is very much 15th century, apparently. Uh, he was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath in, 20, in the 2019 Birthday Honours List. General. Thanks very much, and good morning, everybody. I stand here um, on the Welsh criminal justice system, and I am neither Welsh uh, nor have I been on the wrong side of the criminal justice system. I have, however, actually, in a previous guise, uh, been a defence witness at the Old Bailey for a young corporal who was being and uh, actually was found guilty of spying uh, in Afghanistan with us. So um, uh, he was one of your kind of um, inmates, I think. Um, I just wanted to talk for about 10 minutes or so um, about uh, three or four issues. And actually another, another sort of rabbit hole. The last time I spoke in Church House was about four years ago where the army was holding one of its annual conferences and I was chairing the first morning session. And the night before, we'd had a speaker's dinner, which carried on into the early hours. And I can remember going to bed about 3.30 in the morning after drinking a whiskey bottle with Paul Newton. So I am one of those addicted veterans. And I stood up with a ghastly hangover, and I looked out at the serried ranks of the audience, thinking, crikey, what am I going to talk about? And the only thing I could think of was, I'm a general, I'm called Nick. And, you know, Nick Carter, Nick Parker, Nick Horton, Nick Ashmore, Nick, Nick Eels, you can keep going. A lot of generals are called Nick. And I just said, look, because I was a young thrusting officer, I changed my name by deed poll to Nick at an early stage of my career. I used to be called Boris. And that, <laughs> that word came into my brain from I don't know where, but a number of my chums still now call me Boris. So sometimes... <laughs> Just be careful of what you're doing. I stand before you with two um, props. Firstly, the Veterans Strategy Action Plan, which was trailed by Jesse, which, which is one of my close Bibles. It sits on my bedside table alongside the Gideon Bible. And secondly, a copy of the, um, of the Covenant. Actually, it's not a copy of the Covenant. It's the Officers Association Handbook, but it was the closest I could come up with at the last moment. And I want to talk about both of those a little bit, if I may. But firstly, about Cobzio. And I'm delighted to be uh, chair of Cobzio, uh, Dash the Service Charities Federation. And both those things are aligned in our articles, and it's really weird because we're neither. So when I go and see Prince Charles, which I will do because he's our patron in a couple of weeks' time, he's going to say something along the lines of, Cobzio, what is that all about? And I'm going to say, uh, Your Royal Highness, it's the Confederation of British Serving and Ex-Service Organisations. He's going to say, it's ghastly, get rid of it. And the trouble is we've had it for about two decades now. But the word organisations comes in there, not charities, even though we're the Service Charities Federation. But we have members who are CICs, we have members who are with profit organisations. So we've got some tidying up edges to do around the fringes. And I suppose that's my main theme for being here today. Words matter. Um, in this document, there's a phrase which the Prime Minister introduces on page two, which is making the UK the best place in the world to be a veteran by 2028. Well, that's great. If only I knew what it means. And so my first actually plea to all of you is if you can do some research on working out what will make us the best place in the world to be a veteran by 2028, that would be enormously helpful. Because one of the things that we as a sector and government will need to do in the veteran space is A, to turn this brilliant document, and it's really, really good. There you are, I'm plugging it for Jesse. Um, it's a really great document. We need to work out a, how we deliver sensibly the pledges that government has made in the document. 
But B, when we've worked out what the best place to be an, a, a veteran is by 2028, IR end state, to do some gap analysis on what we've pledged to in terms of the federation and in terms of government, and then what's next steps. So that when we do the next iteration of the document, we've got an evidence-based mechanism on which to do so. The next challenge, I think, is to get after this word veteran. And it's come out today in so many guises. Our eldest veteran, I think, is 108 years old. Our youngest is 16. We use a singular word to pick up people who are positive and valued members of society. We've got a word which covers those who don't wish to be remembered as a veteran. We've got a word which picks up Gurkha veteran or veterans of the Royal Commonwealth Ex-Servicemen's League spread across 27 nations uh, of the world. So the word veteran I find sometimes a little bit vexing because I want to look at it from two prisms from a COBSIO perspective. Um, COBSIO, it's a large um, membership organization of around uh, a thousand charities and some uh, not-for-profit and some with-profit organizations. And around half of those are, or just under half actually, are welfare charities or benevolence charities. And absolutely rightly, that's why we're here today, to talk about how we help veterans in need. But I've got 700 charities, regimental associations and association sub-branches, which are about supporting veterans who are not in need. That's about comradeship, belonging, resilience, membership, capacity building, prophylactic activity. And I think that we're using one word here, really, to describe two things. One, what has been badly construed as mad, bad, and sad. And the second, valued and valuable members of society. And I think we probably need to think about, in our research, how we best capture that dichotomy, this kind of constructive tension between the good part, the glass half full part of being a veteran, and the glass half empty, and I might re return to that in a minute. The other word I want to talk about is transition. Mike picked up at the beginning of today how the objects of the Forcing and Mind Trust talk about transition of service personnel into um, reserve or veterans' uh, lives as a veteran. But actually the word transition to some people is a very, very short um, you know, one day you're a military person, the next day you've transitioned to being a veteran. For other people, that word actually covers the course of their life. So I think understanding the context within which you're using that word transition, to me, is also important. The other area of work um, that I'd like the research community to get into is in this proxy covenant document here. We've got some 7,000 industries have signed up as either bronze or silver or gold members to the Armed Forces Covenant, which is there to ensure that service personnel, A, are not disadvantaged with respect to their um, civilian counterparts, but in some areas, positively advantaged. But as yet, I haven't got the data to understand what 7,000 signatories mean what more I can do either with industry or with local government to enable that to happen. So your help there would be enormously welcome. And my final plea, I suppose, on research would be go back to my idea of valued and valuable members of society. So when I was the Deputy Chief of the General Staff, I used to talk a lot about the social transformation that the armed forces in general, and the army in particular, had for young men and women who were coming into the army from uh, disadvantaged areas of the community and were having life-changing uh, advantages and life-changing opportunities given to them. But I was never really able to quantify the social transformational change that happens with those young men and women when they choose to leave and re-enter civilian employment. And the more research we can have on that area, I think, it's glass half full areas completely, 
but it will enable us to get into that territory of positive engagement, the positive aspects about being a veteran, which is actually one of the themes that Jesse would talk about inside the OVA and the MOD would talk about as well. I just want to finish, if I may, talking about COBSIA and the way it does its business, because really, you know, we are not a directive organization, we're a membership organization. There's no hierarchy here. Um, I and the people who work with me, like Rachel in the audience, Nick in the audience, are there to enable and support others to do their business. Um, our main uh, mechanism for engaging with government um, is through the word we've heard today, clusters. It's a fantastic mechanism to bring charities and organizations together to talk both at the local, the regional, and the national area about both delivery and about policy. Um, we're going through a cluster review right now, led by Mary Mayhew, who seems to do most reviews in the world, um, which will hopefully um, uh, become um, public in about a month's time. Without wishing to steal any of her particular thunder, and having not discussed her findings in any form with her so far. Uh, from my perspective, I'm looking to clusters to think about how does the medical cluster or clusters, both the mental health cluster and our medical advisory committee, work better together to interface with OpCourage? How do we think about small charities in the future? Now that the small charities um, Commission, I think it's called, has just recently closed down. And a relationship there with the National, Char uh, National Commission of Voluntary Organizations, probably. And finally, what do we think about associations and prophylactic activity and resilience? And how do we get after that most positive aspect of um, belonging? So a lot of challenges there, but actually a lot of opportunities. And I suppose if it comes down to a single word to encapsulate all of that, to me, it's about alignment. So everything we do here, be it through a co cooperation or a collaboration or a coherence perspective, let's make sure that we align to give sort of strength to that idea about this being the best place in the world to be a veteran in the next six years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General. And now I'll hand over to Ola to lead us on Wales and the criminal justice system. Ola, thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Persons in Mind Trust Research Center for inviting Wales uh, to present today. Um, we will be presenting on the criminal justice system. I've got uh, two distinguished colleagues with me. I've got Nikki Lloyd-Jones from Glenda University. Nikki has done a lot of evaluative, uh, evaluation research on veterans in Wales. Uh, and I've got Major Rob Denman, who is a governor of Husk Prison and also uh, Prescott Prison as well. Uh, Prescott is an open prison and Husk is a sex offender prison. Uh, and also, I have to just add myself on that list. I'm, I'm an academic at Aberystwyth University. I'm a reader. In law, I run the Veterans Legal Link Project, which is an access to justice project. And I'm on several advisory boards, including an advisory board for the Minister for Social Justice in Wales. Uh, and together, we hope to give you a clear picture of the landscape of criminal justice. I just will say a few things about criminal justice in general. Um, every year, roughly 17,000 veterans uh, transition uh, from military service, and a small minority of those veterans, roughly 5% uh, or 3.5%, depending on which statistics we're looking at, end up uh, in the criminal justice system. Wales accounts for about 250,000 veterans. I know the data, we're all talking about data these days, but roughly speaking, those are the stats. And like everyone else, uh, veterans who end up in the criminal justice system uh, probably are people who suffer or who have experienced social determinants of health in various disguises, uh, whether it's housing, unemployment, uh, family breakdown, 
so it, they normally often have complex situations. One thing that stands out, I think, about veterans in the criminal justice system is in terms of the nature of offending, uh, violent offenses and sexual offenses are probably more distinctive of the characteristics of offending. Um, in terms of our speakers today, uh, Nikki will be talking about issues of identity and mapping various concepts, military identity. She'll be uh, looking at that and looking at the relationship between identity and issues of the challenges of transition, as well as resources, social capital related resources in managing uh, those challenges. Uh, Rob looks at quite an innovative project. Wells, to be fair, have come up with a number of innovative projects which have benefited uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, we have AFLOs, Armed Forces Liaison Officers. We have Veterans NHS Wales. Um, and we also have the supporting transition of military uh, personnel project. And Rob's presentation will cover that aspect. So um, like colleagues in Scotland and Northern Ireland will also attest to we are a small nation. And basically everyone knows everyone and it's helpful in terms of the way uh, uh, multi-agency working and, and collaboration. Even at the local council level, I, I'm on the strategic Armed Forces Strategic Board, and we have the Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, we have Veterans NHS as well. So we all work together, even from the academic sector, which is a great model in terms of the divide between academia and, and, the, and practice. So I shall kick things off <laughs> and introduce them. Nikki, please come in. Oh. I'm not sure. As Ola said, thank you very much. Um, I, North Wales is a small country. North Wales is even smaller. And the, the reason I've been invited to come is because I undertook a piece of research now back in 2016-17 that was mapping the understanding of civilian identity, starting from the premise that as a civilian, I don't really know what it is to be a civilian. In fact, it's only those who've been in the armed forces who can really explain what it is to be a civilian. I was a very naive young researcher. Well, maybe not so young, but I was a naive researcher. And I, um, I figured it would be quite easy I thought getting out there and finding people to talk to who would give me an account of their narrative would be something that would be fairly straightforward. I was mistaken. The first six to 12 months, I would say, was spent trying to engender a form of trust. And this took, in many different forms, I just got out there. As I say, North Wales is largely um, mountains in Conway, but we have 51,000, or in 2014, we had 51,000 veterans that were identified in the census. And Conway, for anybody who, I'm just putting these up because they're pretty pictures, but um, <laughs> Conway, for anybody who's been there, is actually quite a small area, but has an inordinately large veteran population. Now, I went round putting posters up all over Conway. I attended a number of different events and uh, started up a, a social media account, um, even did a local uh, advert in the, in the papers, and to very little effect. So what I was very conscious of was that there is a very... Um, it's not easy to get into the community. However, once you're in, it's amazing how friendly everybody can be. So, the next stage was to become involved in the North Wales Armed Forces Forum. And the reason I put this up is because this is the Blind Veterans Centre in Llandidno. It is um, 
the host, and the, the other reason is because it's the only place that could host this North Wales Armed Forces Forum, which is represented by over 70 organizations, uh, and they meet once every quarter. And the chair until recently was the chair of the, the health board, and Betsy Cadwallader Health Board is the largest health board in North Wales, the only health board in North Wales. But it, um, it means that on occasion, in fact four times a year, virtually all the um, third sector organisations, the local authorities, the six local authorities and the uh, public bodies come together to discuss how well they're doing about supporting veterans or not. And these are representative by the criminal justice, also by housing, um, and obviously the uh, British Legion and SAFA are regular attenders. So I went there and asked their help to enlist recruits for the study. And I was, I was overwhelmed with people who were willing to share their stories. Unfortunately, I'd set myself a very tight um, inclusion and exclusion criteria to the extent that I really only wanted to talk to those who had left the armed forces within five years and lived in North Wales. So I set myself up to a, a pretty hard task and the people that I was being approached by didn't really fit the criteria. So I had to adopt a number of other strategies, but what I did was engage with the people who'd expressed an interest and gathered all their narratives. So I agreed to talk to anybody who was willing to spend time. And this might have been a very ineffective way of engaging trust, but it paid off because as a snowballing exercise, I then started to get invited to more events and people were more inclined to engage with me. So the two, two stages to this project, the first one was to explore the work of veterans to produce themselves as, as civilians, starting with the premise that there is a kind of, um, I wouldn't, I was going to say antipathy, but it might even be stronger than that towards the civilian population. And I, we could debate it, but it became apparent that there is a, a perception of the civilian that may not be, um, as um, comfortable as we'd like to think. So what I was looking for was con how they constructed their narrative that I could hear as a civilian that made them a civilian rather than a member of the armed forces. I have presented this elsewhere, so I am talking about the second stage of this project, which was to prioritize resources veterans identified as essential for transition. Now, I'm sure many of you have been asked to fill in numerous numbers of surveys, and these can be fairly exhausting. And I, I, I assume that if I was to use a more innovative way of gendering a consensus, that this might be um, more acceptable as a way of clustering the responses to present them to the local authorities. So I undertook a concept mapping survey, and it, this was about rating the capabilities and resources. The reason I wanted to look at capabilities and resources was because we weren't necessarily interested in what we could provide for the veterans in transition, but also the capabilities that they saw as essential to help them make the transition. Following the first stage of the study, which was the narrative identity, this graphic, or the graphic mod not model here, for me, seemed to summarize what I could hear which was that there, was, there were definite tensions. And the tensions, in fact, reflect a number of the themes that have been already raised in Scotland and also in the last, by the last presenter, that moving forward was a big, big issue. 
the transition they once coming out of the armed forces there was a sense of optimism and this was going to be something that was going to be obviously if this was an intentional leaving the military there was something positive about it but there was an acknowledgement that there is a change of pace when you're um, working amongst the civilian population that there is no sense of imperative that this was there was a need to consider slowing down to keep to keep with the, the civilians you know putting down roots was an enormous issue partly because um, as one veteran explained to me the thing is you could put off clearing the gutters and mowing the lawn because you knew you might be going on maneuvers in the next couple of weeks so you could put it off and wait till you come back putting down roots means that you have to do the mundane and it's it's a constant mundanity of the everyday and living the moment now this was something that I've really struggled with and would love to explore further but actually it was to do with this sense of as I said imperative the idea of um, being in the moment that occasion when you are you are functioning and you are not necessarily having to think about what you're doing so it's it's escapism but it's also the thrill of that being on it. Oh, I could go on. <laughs> um, but there was a real uh, underlying anxiety about being self-motivated and sustained motivation. The other thing that came out of the initial part of the study was this notion that in the military, you are constantly given feedback, whether it's positive or negative, it's constant, so that you are always getting some feedback. And we know as, <laughs> I could be controversial, as mothers and wives, that we get on with it and very rarely get the level of feedback that we might acknowledge regularly. So it was something that, that was missing was this idea of, I don't even know whether there's any point in doing anything because nobody's giving me any feedback. So this idea of keeping shape, the first thing that was so impressive was the um, strength of the military identity. It was, it was through them like a stick of rock, and I'm being generalized here, but there was a very strong narrative that gave a coherence to this military identity, which, which was apparently not there when exploring the civilian identity. And this tension was, to me, was very apparent about trying to retain that, that strength, strength of identity whilst working and navigating in the flexibility of the civilian um, communities. So, moving on to the second stage, um, and I'd be grateful if Ola could keep an eye on the time since I'm likely to be. <laughs> um, we managed to recruit 23 people to undertake the second stage. Now the concept mapping, the aim behind it was, as I say, to form a concept, um, a consensus amongst the diverse, the most diverse population that I could um, gather. So we were looking for all representatives from all different military backgrounds. We wanted a, a mix of genders, but obviously that was a challenge, and mix of ages, employment status, and disability. We, we managed to um, reach the, the threshold to make the, the findings have a credibility, but it has an internal validity that is not the same as if you were to do a survey. So it is a qualitative approach to gathering a consensus. And it involves three stages. The first is mind mapping, which is that you have a focus group which people are invited to complete. And then we had, we asked everybody to sort in terms of um, piles or um, subheadings, apply subheadings and put all the statements under the, the separate subheadings. We had people, um, we went to the uh, uh, various means to do this. We did it by longhand, individually with individual 
uh, veterans, so it wasn't entirely the most efficient way of going about it, but it, it, it invited that level of trust to believe that they put the effort in, so there was no arbitrary approach to it. And the two rating statements we chose were importance and challenge. The PROM statement we constructed was in a community of North Wales where the successful transition integration of the ex-service per person matters, essential resources and capabilities include. We put a caveat and a context in this to explain the difference between the resources and capabilities, but in effect what we wanted was to make sure that the statements completed that prompt statement. The online um, platform is uh, a powerful analytic uh, software that creates a multidimensional cluster of the statements that were completed. In the end, we had 70, 70 two statements, I think it was. And these were sorted, once they were sorted, you have to go through all the different stages before you can start the analysis. So once we started the analysis, we came up with this point map, which is in effect a cube um, accumulation of the statements and how they were uh, gathered together and then squished. So this point map is the first stage and you can see where people had joined or sorted the different statements. So those that are clustered together are obviously being um, sorted more frequently. The next stage, as it is a qualitative study, is to come up with the most effective way to cluster these statements. And using U Euclidean geometry here, it makes a very visual, quick presentation about what we could hear. And the first one uh, we identified was putting down roots, which resonated with the first stage of the study. And then we had life skills, and these resonated with the previous speakers. Future plans and direction. Changing pace, again, came up. And then making a living as a civilian, mental health and addiction support, community welcome, and veteran links. The next stage was to um, analyze the importance. Now you can see the, the layers of the different clusters. So the more layers was the rating of importance um, placed on those particular clusters. And the one that got the most ratings in relation to importance was putting down roots. The second was changing pace. And the third was future plans and direction. I'm obviously only going to give you a brief summary of the report, but the second one, interestingly, the challenge, the most difficult, was the mental health and addiction support. Making a living as a civilian and changing pace. Putting down roots was also a feature. The others were identified as, as obviously relevant, but not necessarily as important or as much of a challenge. Just as a matter of interest, there is the opportunity for doing a bivariate analysis, which given if we could have conducted it over a larger number of people, would have no doubt provided some really interesting um, data, but I just drew this one out as a, as a point of interest because when we separated the, uh, the participants into those with less than six years experience and those to more than six years experience, you can see how the priority of mental health addiction support was so much more relevant to those who had a short military experience rather than those who had a longer time in the military whereas both sets of participants acknowledged putting down roots as being of, of um, equal importance and challenge. The veteran links, 
you can see at the bottom is the lowest down, but I suspect that that's because it's in priority rather than the fact that they don't see them as important. We did have a number of conversations about the being a veteran as a theme, and that was something that definitely resonated with the, the previous speaker and the comment of, I don't see myself as a veteran. However, it was um, something else to be explored. So, the putting down roots and changing pace were a recurrent theme. And not only was it a recurrent theme for, um, for all the participants, but it was also identified within the statements. And as you'll see on the right-hand side, these were the list of statements that accompanied this in, um, uh, excuse me, but this software is an American software and they refer to them as go zones. But the idea behind it is that the, the axis in the middle uh, depict the mean uh, points of the rating scores. So as you can see up in the right hand corner in the green zone are the quick wins. Those are the ones that the participants identified as of most importance and most challenge and that those should be the ones that the local authorities or um, policy makers should take into account. Those that are um, in the other sectors are the ones you can work on as you've gone through, go, as you prioritize. So from the changing pace, I've just to help clarity, identified the, uh, the four statements that depict this notion of pe changing pace, which include resist trying to settle all your differences at the same time, an ability to endure frustrations and rejections, having emotional resilience, tolerance, and tolerance, I have to say, came in the terms of tolerance of a civilian community, <laughs> uh, identification of short, medium, and long-term goals, and the ability to set achievable goals and don't beat yourself up if you don't get there. So you can hear that this is the, these were the participants' voice. This was what they wrote, and it was up to us to, uh, to give it a subheading that could then be um, interpreted by the policymakers and the local um, authorities. Putting down roots, Again, you can see number 29 was automatic placements for children in schools when moving into the area. And number one was affordable housing in the area of work with good schools. And the other one, local housing in a close community. So making a living as a civilian, these were the uh, statements that are identified that they found were the most priority. So in summary, we identified the capabilities for successful transition were the confidence to navigate personal public services and enduring self-motivation and resilience, and then obviously the access to affordable housing and access to mental health support, and the infrastructure influencing successful transition in Wales Primarily is, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware that we've had a recent, well, 2015, that there was the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that has become a legislation within North, in Wales that is requiring five ways of working. And that is that we look at provision of, by, local, uh, by public bodies to have a long-term vision to integrate, involve, and collaborate and prevent, which is entirely consistent and complementary to the Armed Forces Covenant. So um, with that in mind, the biggest influence that we made with regard to this study was the appointment of the Armed Forces Liaison Officers, which I was involved in the recruitment of, and I know I've worked really well in Wales to align the policies within local, uh, local authorities to meet the needs of housing, education, um, health, and DWP 
to be able to be able to um, meet the needs of the veterans population. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for all that. <laughs> I'd next like to introduce uh, Major Rob Den Denman. Is my presentation up? <laughs> Hello, everyone. I've, I've got a couple of apologies to make right from the start, off the bat, so to speak. Um, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm a prison governor, uh, and I think the major sort of, I don't know how that got in there. Um, I'm also a reservist, uh, and I am the OC of the reserve company of the Military Provost Staff uh, MCTC, which is a bit of a busman's holiday, to be honest. Um, for those of you that are, that's Colchester Military Prison. Um, Uscombe Proscoid it, it, is a bit of a unique site because it's, it's split. Uh, Usk deals with long-term high-risk men convicted of sexual offending, so they are serving prisoners. We don't have a remand f function and Proscoid is Wales's only resettlement prison, so it's a Cat D open prison and resettles men who have served or are at the end of long sentences back into the community, and they can be uh, convicted of a variety of offences. There are very few men convicted of sexual offences at Proscoid. It, it's in the main um, people convicted of other serious uh, or violent crimes. That's a bit about me anyway. And my other apology is this presentation landed on me um, at about midnight last night as I left you. <laughs> so my rehearsal time was on the train on the way up here. So why did ex-armed uh, service personnel become a priority in criminal justice? Now there's three reports there. There's one other that isn't mentioned and I'll, I'll hit on that slightly. So firstly, the Phillips Review in November 2014, sorry, aimed to identify properly the reasons for ex-service personnel ending up in a criminal justice system to look at the support provided to them and how that support could be improved. It also noted that there was a lack of knowledge on the part of criminal justice professionals as to the needs of former service personnel and an appropriate, that the appropriate training was a matter of luck, not as a, as a whole service piece. Following on from that, the, Prob uh, the Probation Institute instigated a review called the Profile of Provision for Armed Forces Veterans Under Probation in 2016. And it set out to profile and analyse the current state of services across the piece, both England and Wales. This then led to ex-armed service personnel becoming a priority group in a, another document called the Framework to Support Positive Change for Those at Risk of Offending in Wales 2018 to 2023, which was produced by the All Wales Criminal Justice Board. There was another piece of legislation, or another report in there that was commissioned in 2011 um, which was a report by the Howard League in, for Penal Reform on whether that, that common misnomer of, of the vert veteran lurking around the corner with the shotgun, whether that was actually true or actually was a bit of fallacy. Right, there you go. That's my bit of a view on it. So the Integrated Offender Management Cymru aims to deliver a co coordinated approach to the management of individuals who have been identified as priority personnel. It's led by... Um, an all Wales strategic partnership which consists of HMPPS in Wales, which is the Prison and Probation Service in Wales, the National Police Chiefs Council, Welsh Government, and is delivered in partnership with the, the four police and crime commissioners across Wales, what was uh, the Wales Community Rehabilitation Company, but is since, 2000, no, since June last year has been brought back into the probation service and other sta stakeholders. What we came up with was, a, was a, a project called STOMP, which stands for Supporting the Transition of Military Personnel, and that's kicked off in 2016. The primary goal was design, implement, and embed a consistent business-as-usual whole system approach across the complete piece from arrest, uh, first encounter with the criminal justice system, up to and include disposal, be it custodial or non-custodial. So stomp then. As I said, it was formed in 2016 uh, with the primary goals, as I said, to design, implement, embed as business as usual that, as business as usual, that approach. Uh, our achievements to date, or the achievements to date, uh, we've established and engaged and trained a network of 70 champions across Wales from various criminal justice agencies, including the police, the probation service, and what was the community rehabilitation companies. We delivered training to those staff complete across the piece across Wales, We've run a communication campaign and awareness training, 
Um, we provide, well, we've come up with a directory of services, um, which is um, on an online resource called Jewis. We've got branded promotional material. We've uh, constructed a prisoner pathway implementation, and we've worked also closely with MCTC on improving the pathway for men leaving service on discharge uh, and resettling back in Wales. There have been another number of positive networking events, Armed Forces Day and Community Days. We share good practice through police subgroups, prison subgroups, um, and with COBCO. Uh, we've commissioned research with Wrexham University, uh, specifically a piece called Ex Armed Service Personnel Healthy Relationships in Domestic Abuse, a quality of study. We've uh, commissioned research with Swansea University, Ex Armed Service Personnel in the Criminal Justice System in Wales. We've commissioned three short films which are Welsh-specific and draw on problems facing people leaving service and getting involved with criminal justice. Uh, we've given consistent access to ex-service personnel, uh, providing specific support lines in the Welsh estate. Uh, we developed a monthly data tool and disseminated all of that to our stakeholders to monitor increasing identification and address needs. We provided briefings to service charities, specifically around those committed of, uh, convicted of sexual offending, uh, another briefing around working with people with personality disorders. Uh, we provided a prevent briefing, uh, supporting veterans who may come in contact with extremist organisations. And we've done a mental health scoping exercise, uh, looking at referrals between custody and community health care provision. Sorry. That's it. Right, it's not working. Okay, no problems. Right, I'll crack on then. Just imagine there's a slide up there. Okay, so the next slide, hopefully, was going to talk to you about the lifestyle. Of, uh, there it is, there we go. Thankful. Around the life cycle of offending. So research makes it clear, all of that research makes it clear, that for the majority of those who have served in the armed forces do not become involved with the criminal justice system unless they start working for it. And after leaving the services, it significantly improves lifetime opportunities and outcomes. But for those that fall through the cracks, there are a couple of categories. And this is the research, not me saying this. So it tended to be that those that originally, prior to service, came from a low socioeconomic or poor educational background. There was also some, some correlation with that around people who had demonstrated antisocial behaviour before they went into the services that in effect their time within the army or within the armed forces was a protective factor and they resumed that offending when they left. Veterans of, uh, tend to be older, sorry, on average than the general population of offenders uh, and this may be because military service acts to reduce the opportunity for that population to engage in offending. There was also some stuff around those who experienced difficult or challenging conditions while in military service and those who have challenges post-discharge, so we've seen that from a couple of the previous slides about people who just kind of fall off the cliff, marriage breakdowns um, and emotional difficulties, etc. Right, so this is all about asking the question and identification, and, and that first step for a veteran coming into custody or on their first contact with criminal justice is, is, is key. So what we try to do with our practitioners, police officers, prison officers and probation officers, is prompt people to ask the question. So if, have you asked the question, have you or a member of your family ever served in the armed forces? If yes, what do you do? Firstly, you need to explain to people that the reason that you're asking them the question, and I'm talking about really emotional and really um, volatile situations, the reason I'm asking you this question is so that I can plug you into the right support services. It's not any... Um, conspiracy on our part, we are genuinely trying to help you in your transition through custody. So that's the first process that we needed to get through. It, we also explain that many of the service charities not, don't only support the service member themselves, but also family and, and loved ones. So police custody suites are the first points of contact, as I said, following the initial arrest and can be the first formal opportunity for ex-armed service personnel to be identified or signposted. The identification of military personnel within criminal justice and providing access to appropriate interventions and supports 
improves outcomes and reduces reoffending. During the STOMP project, we developed a monthly data report, as I've said, to monitor identification and the unique needs. And the number we identified in Wales stands at between 2 and 3% of those who actually came in contact with criminal justice. These reports we then shared with key st stakeholders to ensure the provision was being met. It is important that we identify, verify, and record ex armed service personnel on our caseload to ensure that we support these service users effectively to meet their individual needs and refer them when on to specialist services when that is needed. For those who are not going to disclose, part of what we did as well is making the, the information accessible to them. And one of the recent, um, and this isn't anecdotal, but one of the recent drivers for people not um, disclosing that they're members of the armed services or ex-members of the armed services is the, the risk you face in custody, especially if you go into the long-term high security estate. There are a lot of people there who, who uh, would target you for your service, as they have done for members of staff. Right, ex-armed services, armed forces, personnel, identification in police custody timeline. So this is how it works out. So, ex-armed forces personnel identification in police custody timeline. Time line. Stomp liaised with the four forces in Wales to, it to produce a new poster and leaflet for custody streets, which lists the contact details of several veteran agencies with a brief explanation of the role of each of them. A smaller version was also available in business card size and handed out to individuals who had disclosed their military status. We delivered training to all custody staff, including custody nurse and diversion staff across Wales, with resources shared of online directories, e.g. the Veterans Gateway, COBIO, the COBIO, COBSIO members directory, and our unique Wales directory that I've already mentioned, Jewis. There are a plethora of ex-armed service per services, which can sometimes be difficult to navigate via the internet. So therefore, we produce a short directory covering national and local resources, Veterans NHS Wales, accommodation, employment training, and, e and education, finance, relate, and information on the armed forces liaison officers hosted by the local authorities and funded by Welsh Government. We also held communication campaigns and awareness raising through the project. And this is what the resources look like. The leaflets, posters, and business cards were for police custody suites, courts, probation officers, and prisons, giving the service person a consistent message throughout their journey in Wales and an opportunity to disclose and for those not wanting to disclose, the access to the information for self-referral. This next slide shows the, the, the front sheet of, um, or the front entrance page of the equip system, which is a probation system, or the probation of, uh, services computerised system. So in the probation setting, uh, they've been proactive in the advancement of ex-service personnel across probation services with, within Wales. They've created new posts as well as formalising processes that were already in place. With systems in place to disseminate information through email updates and event invitations to probation champions, gaining knowledge of all up-to-date services available and where to signpost. They also commissioned videos to aid staff, training resources around service personnel issues which featured service users, and the videos were particularly intended to highlight issues around the importance of identifying and signposting. As I said, the development of a monthly data report disseminated to our stakeholders to monitor the identification and address the unique needs of this population. Our process and supporting documents were available on the QIP, our online process and quality platform, including the, seven, the newly released seven minute briefing, uh, a national good practice guide for practitioners and managers, and the process for verification. Identification of needs. So the last quarter of 2021 highlights that continued awareness does increase the identification on entry through awareness sessions with court SBOs and auditing the equality information form. So it encourage pe encourages people who would not have identified before to, in to identify now. So what are the needs? This comparison with our general population, so there you can see uh, all is the general prison population, the general criminal justice experience population, and XASP is obviously the, the individuals we're talking about. 
The studies suggest that ex-service personnel who are in contact with the UK criminal justice system in custody and under community supervision are more likely to be male, white and older on an average than those who have not served in the armed forces. Again, we need to consider the social profile of those who are failing to identify. Ex-armed uh, ex forces personnel identification in custody timeline. So what happens when they come into prison, basically? So, as I said, the STOMP project created a pathway and we developed the prisoner pathway implementation with a review with individualised pathways created for e each prison, including MCTC, uh, for those that were returning back to Wales. One major impact of the STOMP project in terms of information accessibility has been the addition of free phone numbers uh, onto prisoner pin phones so they are able to access those charities that we identify in the, in the resource. Our Welsh prisons have collaborated with positive networking events, uh, Armed Forces Day events and Community Veterans uh, Days. We carried out a mental health scoping exercise on links and referrals between custody and community health and veterans NHS Wales. Next. I'm aware of the time, you see. Right, MCTC and MAPA. So MCTC, for those that you don't know, it is the military prison in Colchester. It has an operational capacity of 264, but the average role, and I, I think this is, this is really important, the average role is about 60, and that's for a service, uh, you know, a combined force total of what? Quarter of a million troops. Um, so they spend 14 days to two years at MCTC, one to 14 days, they will go into a, a local service custody facility. There's about half a dozen of them UK-wide. Um, and if they're serving more than two years, they will transfer to HMB Chelmsford and then they go into offender flow uh, back into the civilian estate, basically. If they're released from MCTC on discharge from the forces, there's st no statutory requ requirement now for supervision, but there would be if they were released from a civilian prison for a similar sentence. Uh, but it is MCTC practice for uh, the employment of DUS that we refer them to the Shaw Trust or to the local RFCA, uh, but no DUS have been released from MCTC in the past two and a half years, no fixed abode, so that's, that's a good story. Uh, the Ministry of Defence has a critical role to play in MAPA, and MCTC sit on their local MAPA 1 board. Uh, MAPA is for those that are convicted of the very serious, the, the most serious sexual and violent offences. So in making criminal justice veteran friendly and the armed forces community stakeholders offender friendly, we held a series of workshops. Uh, as I said, we had a series of briefings uh, around those who commit sexual offences, uh, those who have personality disorders and those prevent briefings around people who are exposed to extremist groups. Moving forward then. So phase two of STOMP ended in, on the 31st of March 2021, uh, make, marking the end of what had been a really successful four years. Although the project had ended, much of the stuff is embedded in what we do in Wales. So an SRO, a senior responsible officer, uh, works to oversee work relating to ex-armed armed service personnel in Wales, uh, responding specifically to the evaluation recommendations, um, sustaining our achievements to date, monitoring and recording performance, maintaining those relationships that we built um, around joint practices between service charities and criminal justice partners, and liaising with existing SPOX champions across HMPPS to promote high standards of work with ex-armed service personnel. It is a work in progress. We've also started, as I finish up, a collaborative work between Valdor SV, which is Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence boards at each region, uh, and ex-armed service personnel work streams. We are raising awareness with a load of cost-cutting stuff between different work streams, um, specifically about developing veteran-specific um, work community work placements for those who don't meet the custody threshold. Improving access to mental health or PTSD in our prisons, uh, and continued to support to the police, four police forces uh, across the region. Uh, we also have involvement in a programme called Proud, which is uh, an initiative to provide 
employment opportunities for long-term unemployed members of the ex-armed services community, not necessarily those in, in custody. So it is our, our, our attempt to reach out. Uh, and, and that's me. Any questions? Um, we've come to the end of our presentation. We've received quite a number of uh, questions, but it, it appears as if we will just publish the answers online because we, we were told to finish at one. But I just want to say that uh, for me, one of the key uh, themes that r runs across all the presentations, also the Scottish one, is identification, and I think identity. It seems to be very poignant from all the speakers we've heard so far. So thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Ola. We've got uh, 50 minutes for lunch now, please. So if we could be back here in uh, 50 minutes, that would be splendid. Thank you. <laughs>